All right. So hopefully on the way up, as you guys made your way up, your shuttle driver mentioned a little bit about two different kinds of moraines. Of course, the uh, terminal moraine, one of the glacier course side in 1843, then those push or sessional moraines, as it's been making its way back over the last 172 years. Now, I actually have two more kinds of moraines to show you all on our way out. Uh, the first of which I'm going to show you is responsible for the formation of the second one I'm going to show you. But the first one, while it's nice and close, it's on our right-hand side right now, that large hill you can see, that one we call a lateral moraine. So, of course, running alongside or laterally along the glacier. Now, its formation is slightly different, as, of course, the glacier is pushing rock and debris ahead of itself, so it's actually pushing it out to either side. So much like a conveyor belt effect, as she pushes the rock and debris out to either side, up over the peak here, and then drops it down this close side towards us. So let's say we were here in 1843. Well, we can walk right up the hill here and right out and onto the glacier. And we know this because at one time, a glacier will always be as thick as its lateral rain is tall, yet never exceed in thickness the height of its lateral rain. So essentially much like when you fill up a bathtub and fill it up with bubbles, and then you drain the bathtub out, you always have that top line of bubbles left in behind, much like the top line of our lateral rain. That is this sort of remnant or a little bit of a historical marker as to where the glacier was during its most recent advancement, was that was the thickest at which it reached. Uh, nowadays, climbing up there, a little bit of a different story, a little, little less, uh, well, a little less safe, that's for sure, because each step forward is about three steps back, and you'd be trying to make your way farther and farther up, and once you did get to the top, well, you probably wouldn't want to look over it, because, well, it's a 320-foot drop, or about 100 meters straight down on the other side. So definitely not nearly as safe or as graceful as it would have been back in 1843. Now, as we are making our way to higher and higher altitudes here, uh, you may be noticing that the life, well, it's pretty much just disappearing. On our left-hand side here, we have just the last remnants of life we're going to see, or at least the uh, last remnants of life attempting to be life, you could say, looking uh, much more like toothpicks. These poor trees is a flag the entire way around, as we are now in the Alpine Zone, the highest ecoregion of the Canadian Rockies. So anything living up here has uh, quite an interesting look to it. Uh, Crumple Holtz is something that is uh, affected by a lot of these things, as, of course, the conditions are quite extreme. Now, Krumholtz uh, is what causes the uh, sort of bend in those trees. Uh, Krumholtz is basically uh, the uh, same sort of thing, except it's genetic because of all the, uh, the years of basically this uh, crazy abuse from all of this weather, and they have quite a, quite a tough life. So up here in the Alpine Zone, it is mostly about, of course, the rocks, ice, and snow. All the things that don't really mind the weird weather because, well, you now the rocks are just hanging out up here just rocking out. Now, all the rocks that you see, they are all sedimentary rocks. So we have limestone, sandstone, shale, beautiful mountains form within about 65 million years ago. Now, of course, in the last 65 million years, well, a lot has been happening. Uh, of course, we have many glacial periods and glaciers coming through this area, many, many periods, each one of which take away more and more of our mountains, until as it stands now, they've actually lost more than half of their original height. So, quite amazing to imagine that, say, we were here 15,000 years ago, during the end of the Wisconsin Ice Age, well, we'd be under about two kilometers worth of ice as we stand right now. So, quite a, quite a different area to say at least about 1.2 miles it works out to of solid ice, which so is the tops of some of the tallest peaks poking out and over. So of course, losing more than half of their original height, our mountains uh, would have actually rounded the height of, let's say, the Himalaya Mountains, of course, Mount Everest, part of that range, sitting at 8,848 meters tall, of course, the tallest mountain in the world. Well, a good example of one of ours, coming up on our left-hand side there, the beautiful Mount Athabasca, it's about 3,491 meters tall, about 11,171 feet, of course, much less than half of its original height. And then, of course, to its right, my favorite mountain of the area, the beautiful Mount Andromeda. This one literally looks like it has had a bowl shape, like an ice cream scooper taken right out of it, because of that glacier sitting inside it. And, of course, the Andromeda Glacier, located right inside there, uh, which I'm going to give us a little more information about once we're out on the Athabasca Glacier, which you get a much better vantage point looking up and at it from here. We're only seeing just a little portion of it, as we can see now, just almost like a tongue sticking out there. Now, of course, Mount Andromeda, this is about 3,450 meters tall, so about 11,100 feet. Uh, they're what we call the 11,000 or so. Uh, 11 of the 22 tallest peaks in the Canadian Rockies do surround the Columbia Ice Field, all in and around the 11,000 foot range. So quite, uh, quite large mountains, to say the least. Now, right now, though, we are on the bedrock of Mount Athabasca, and you would figure we should have some pretty good stability because, well, we're on the bedrock. But uh, surprisingly enough, a very unstable area because as the Athabasca Glacier is, of course, receding, losing its length, but also downwasting, what we call losing its overall thickness. Uh, basically, the poor lateral rain no longer has a crutch to hold it in place, so it'll collapse down and out, 
nothing left here to displace it is what we are driving on right now. So this is all slid on about a 45 degree angle, a total of about 80 feet since just the 1980s. So a lot of shift in a very short 35 years. Now we are going to have to do quite an interesting thing. We're going to have to go down 18 degrees or a 32% grade. So I do hope everyone decide to bring along a brown pair of pants with them because, uh, well, it's a pretty steep hill to say the least. Now it will work a little bit better than coffee, that's for sure, and a lot quicker than coffee. Uh, luckily for us, though, we do get to watch another bus go down ahead of us, so at least you can uh, totally see that it is completely feasible. Uh, now, don't fear, these buses are specifically designed for this hill. Uh, they can handle up to 20 degrees or a 36% grade, so we always err on the side of caution. I use the bunny ears because, well, we're about to go down a lateral moraine and nothing is really that safe about doing such a thing. Now, of course, the rule is we can only send one bus down the hill at a time, for safety precautions, of course, because if we have any mechanical failures, we don't want to careen down the hill and slam into the back of number 548. But while she's on her way down, we can take our time and uh, get ready for our descent. So first thing we do is always put the bus down into first gear. Of course, we don't want to be doing a Mach 10 by the time we reach the hill here, turning this into a hot wheels track, so we uh, put our bus in nice low gear. Also, engage our front wheel drive, so we are actually be powering with all six wheels as we make our way down the hill. And then finally, and the most important thing of all, is actually do request that you all throw on your lap belts for me. Uh, now the hill is quite steep, and uh, people do fall out of their seats a lot, so we uh, did it so I'm kidding, there's no belts in this entire bus. The only belts on this bus are located on the engine, or at least I hope they are, otherwise we're going to have a hard time getting down this hill. But when we're ready, you guys trust me? Uh, that was a mixed bag of yeses and noes there. You trust the bus at least? Uh, ooh, don't hurt her feelings, she'll break on us. You're a good girl, everyone loves you. They're just kidding, they're just kidding. All right. Well, if you guys do get nervous, you can do like I do. Just uh, close your eyes and hang on to something in front of you. Luckily, I have a big old steering wheel here to hold on to. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. And we are off. All right, so just as we start to go down the hill there, you may have the really works. This is a transmission lockup that we engage. So uh, it's built into these vehicles, essentially coupling the motor and transmission together. So essentially as fast as the motor will spin is the fastest the transmission will spin. So we are completely locked into first gear, uh, whereas we can only go about 22 or 2300 RPM. We, this is the fastest that we will make our way down the hill nice and slow. And of course, we get a nice view of all the things around us. We have to our right-hand side, it's the beautiful Sublopta Lake down there in the valley. It's actually the newest Horn Glacier Lake in the entire Canadian Rockies, and this city is 870. Just a baby as far as glacier lakes go. As well, on the other side of the valley, you can see the other lateral lakes. Of course, there are two, one on the other side of the glacier. You can see that 320-foot uh, drop, or 100-meter drop down the other side there. Quite a, uh, quite a sizable drop, to say the least, of course. And as we make our way a little farther down, you notice that about, uh, well, about, uh, about 11 o'clock towards the top of the glacier, and about 5 o'clock down towards the tail, we have this large ridge of rock laying across the glacier. Now, this is our fourth and final kind of moraine. Formed up when the lateral moraine will basically collapse out underneath the weight of itself, actually slide out and cover over part of the glacier. So it's an average of about 4 feet worth of rock, with an average of about 85 feet worth of ice underneath it. It's our beautiful ice cord moraine. So all this rock does quite an amazing thing. Of course, working more in favor of the glacier than it does for us, as do most things out here in nature. Of course, the ice underneath here is being kept so cold and away from the elements that it's actually completely stagnant and actually we're the last part of the glacier to melt away. Now, the ice that sits in front of us right now it moves about just about an inch a day, about 4 centimeters per day towards the highway, averaging about 10 to 15 meters per year, so about 30 to 45 feet every single year. Of course, you can get accelerated cycles or accelerated uh, little movements, but for the most part, it averages about uh, 10 to 15 meters per year. Now, of course, the really dangerous part then becomes for us being in a 55,000 pound bus right now, I don't really know what we're driving across. So for all we know, we could roll across an ice cave, which we would then collapse, fall into our gyms, and probably never be seen again. So luckily for us, we do have lots of machinery, which will come out here sometimes up to four times a day to make sure that this ice core moraine road we're on right now is as safe as it can possibly be. So let's actually collapse those out for us and uh, fill them in with some rock and roof in the area, give us this semi-smooth surface that we're currently driving across. Now directly ahead of us, you'll notice there is a large puddle there. This is actually our rookie bath. So we take all of our first year drivers and we throw them on in there. They go in nice and pink and come out nice and blue, much like the glacier, as you can imagine as well, with the water only being about a degree above zero. Some of the gentlemen also coming out a little bit less of a man as well. Now I myself, I prefer to drink the water rather than bathe in it. I'm actually 86 years old, believe it or not. I just drink glacier water every single day. So it keeps me looking nice and young. And luckily for me, I've been fooling my 23-year-old girlfriend now for a solid two years. Hopefully she never finds out, otherwise I'm going to be a lonely old man. Now of course, this water does serve a real purpose for us. We use it to clean off our tires. We want to get them as clean as we can before we get onto the glacier. We try to keep what's called the albedo coefficient, or the overall reflectability, as high as we can. 
was actually trying to reduce, of course, our environmental impact on the glacier, and as well we're trying to keep it as reflective as we can to make sure this road is actually going to stay flat and not turn into a well, much of the glacier to our left and right hand sides. As of course it is ice, so there's a big spot of mud left on it, as you can imagine, that will turn into a huge marble even within a day or two. So we just these these well every evening, just in case there's any marble still on the road, and you may notice though on either side of us right now, there's all this almost like dirt dust or laying on the glacier. This is a naturally occurring dust, it's what we call cryotype, and it can come from many different sources. Of course, our buses are one of the sources that we cannot deny, but all glaciers, you know, those from all the world do experience cryotype, but from other sources such as volcanic ash, uh, eruption in Iceland, a country is still producing energy with coal that will uh, put dust up into the atmosphere. I uh, even forest fires, such as we have burning uh, all the way over in British Columbia there, and put that 250 up in burning at this time as well. Even something as close as the lateral right up to a left or right hand side collapse will put that dust into the air. Now, we humans, of course, we have our lungs, and our lungs don't do that dust there. That means we have no effect from it. But of course, the glacier having no lungs means, of course, it is always accumulating and sticking to it as the glacier nice and wet during its melt season. That dust nice and dry, so it stick up and she magnetically start to pull itself together into what we call witch hats. So you can see the piles of crap that are sort of the it basically looks like a big piles of coal sort of sitting there and hanging out. You can see the little one side of the foam over on the left hand side there. south measured direction in about 11 kilometers, or sorry, 21 kilometers. Now as far as the difference between the two goes, well, imagine the ice field kind of like a giant lake, and all of the glaciers that attach to it into beautiful rivers. Now I use this analogy because, well, the ice field, instead of building up water, it's building up glacial ice. But just like a river, and attached to a lake, it will build up all of that glacial ice, and eventually start to overflow, and then form a set of rivers, are beautiful glaciers. But glaciers are always constantly connected to the ice field, always receiving a fresh flow of ice. On the Columbia Ice Field, we have a total of six that are attached to it. Of course, we're here on the Athabasca Glacier. On the other side of Mini Dome Ridge, you may have seen it from the parking lot, one of my favorites, the beautiful Dome Glacier. As well, a little farther north, we have the beautiful Stuckfield Glacier. Now, on the other side of the ice field, we have two more glaciers. One that points in a northwest direction, that's the Columbia Glacier. And another one pointing in the southwest direction, that's the Castlegar Glacier. And finally, the largest of all our island valleys, the uh, beautiful Saskatchewan Glacier. actually comes directly out the south of the ice field, about 8 kilometers long, excuse me, and about 2 kilometers wide. Now, out on our left-hand side, we can finally see our two independent glaciers. So, these ones, well, they've been disconnected. They are cut off from their inheritance. They're no longer receiving a fresh flow of glacial ice. So, they see actually slowly but surely withering away. Now, there are two different styles of independent glaciers. They actually have their own names as well. The leftmost of the two is the AA Glacier, hands down the most Canadian in the area. We call it an independent Hanging Valley Glacier. The hanging part, those huge steps coming down from its right-hand side. And, of course, to its right, my favorite of all, the beautiful Andromeda Glacier. This one's what we call a Cirque Glacier. So with thousands of years carving itself farther and farther into Mount Andromeda, it's carved itself so far in now, it's actually stuck inside of the bowl that it's carved for itself. So now it has no ability to slide forwards or backwards from its current position. So it is in fact due to slowly and slowly. It's already much as soon as it can to cover it to it. On top of that bowl shape, you can find see Now we are almost here at a turnaround point. So we just have two major rules. First of all, we can say nobody goes in behind or underneath the buses, as of course they are constantly backing in and out. 
We do as well fast breakfast, so make sure we don't need any pancakes out here on the glacier. As well, we do ask that you guys stay within the confines of the area that we have provided. For those around the edges of the turnaround point, there is a river running there. We do ask, however, that you stay on the inside of that river for your own safety, as it is a very warm day today. Lots of stuff in the glacial ice outside this area is extremely slick. Also, we've got crevasses up to about 250 feet deep, so that's a, a dangerous thing outside this zone. Now, San Francisco has maintained its safe zone. Of course, it is quite safe, but there are little holes you'll notice uh, marked out with cones. Some we haven't even found yet, so just do your best to uh, watch your step while you're walking around it there. If you're going to take any photographs, I recommend just sort of standing still uh, and then taking the photographs and then uh, continue to move and watch where you're standing. Otherwise, everyone, we will be here until 4.45. So you guys get a solid uh, 16 minutes out here. So while we are out here, of course, uh, enjoy your time out there. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and ask me. Don't be shy. If I don't know the answer, I'll just make something up that sounds like it should make sense. But otherwise, everyone, enjoy your time out there on the beautiful Athabasca Glacier. Once you do get off the bus here, you will be standing on 265 meters or 848 feet of solid glacial ice. You all enjoy your time out there on the beautiful Athabasca Glacier. I'll see you back on this bus, the big beautiful blue one, for 445. Enjoy your time out there, everyone. Have fun.
한번 만져봐 만져봐 잡지 던져 힘껏 던져 Let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. 